Welcome everyone. My name is Layla and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Today's webinar is HPV Prevention for Cancer Survivors by Dr. Nancy Durand, followed by a presentation from Abby Morris on the power of the here and now, reducing stress and anxiety with mindfulness. Dr. Durand is an Associate Professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She received her medical degree from McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at McGill University. She is on staff at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and her clinical practice focuses on HPV and colposcopy. She teaches at the undergraduate and postgraduate level and speaks nationally and internationally about HPV and HPV vaccination. Abby Morris is a certified mindfulness, meditation, and yoga instructor who works to educate and provide healing services to those struggling with mental health. Abby began her path of passionate work after experiencing firsthand the transformational power of these healing practices in her personal journey to recovery from an eating disorder. You can learn more about Abby at yogabyabby.com. In today's webinar, Dr. Durand will review the changing landscape of HPV-related diseases and cancers. We will discuss methods of HPV prevention for current cancer patients and cancer survivors. Attendees will learn about the evidence for HPV vaccination in adults, and practical tips will be provided on how to access HPV vaccination. We will then have a Q&A session with Dr. Duran, and you can submit your questions using the question tabs on your control panel throughout her presentation. Afterwards, Abby will unpack the profound impact of mindfulness and meditation in reducing stress and anxiety. She will explain why mindfulness is so important, how we can fit it into our own lives in a way that works for us, and practice a mindfulness exercise together to explore these strategies further. Throughout this presentation, she will discuss ways to make this simple for us to bring into our day-to-day. -day. For those who have not attended an earlier webinar, the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network is an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about health system complexities, connect with others to plan action, and act to promote best care and healthier survivorship. If you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at survivornet.ca. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on YouTube. In addition, the slides will be available on SlideShare and links to both will be sent to the email you provided. I'll now turn things over to our presenter. Welcome, Dr. Durand. Thank you so much, Layla, and uh, thanks also to Abby for joining me today. It's a topic that you're going to see is of great interest when we discuss HPV-related diseases and prevention, as you will see. This is actually an issue that affects all of us. As Abby, as Layla mentioned, I work at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto, and my clinical practice is focused on colposcopy, which deals with the diagnosis and management of pre-invasive and invasive diseases of the cervix and the lower genital tract. So in this talk, as she mentioned, I'd like to discuss the changing burden of HPV-related diseases including the fact that we now know that HPV is increasingly causing diseases beyond just the cervix. I'd then like to describe to you some examples of the pathways you might follow if diagnosed with HPV, and we'll discuss some of the methods of prevention of HPV-related diseases. And then we'll finish up with some of the practical logistics of HPV vaccination. So let's start by describing the HPV itself and the diseases that it can cause. HPV is human papillomavirus and it's the most common sexually transmitted infection around the world. It's passed from person to person via intimate sexual contact, but in fact, it doesn't necessarily require intercourse for transmission, but intimate sexual contact. More than 75% of all sexually active adults will have at least one HPV infection during their lifetime. And so you could also say then that it's more normal to have had an HPV infection at some point than to have never had an HPV infection. 30 to 65% of adults are infected at any one point in time. There are more than 100 types of HPV, but only about 40 infect the anogenital tract. We divide them into low risk types, which can cause external genital warts and low grade precancerous cells, and then high risk HPV types, which can cause high grade precancers and the invasive cancers. Some of the HPV types are more common than others, and the strains that you can see highlighted in blue and red cause 90% of all the HPV related diseases. 
If we then look at what might happen to you if you're exposed to HPV or if one of your loved ones is exposed to HPV, number one, you might become an asymptomatic carrier of HPV, meaning you might be able to transmit it to future partners. Number two, you might develop external genital warts. And number three, you might develop precancerous cells or cancer at various sites, including, if you're female, the cervix, the vagina, vulva, which is the skin outside the vagina. If you're male, you could develop penile cancer. And both females and males can develop cancer of the anal epithelium, as well as of the mouth and throat, which we call the oropharynx. So what is your risk of exposure to HPV if you have a new partner? On the left, we can see the prevalence of HPV in women as we get older. Now, prevalence is the chance that a person has an HPV infection at any one point in time. So it's like a snapshot in time. And you can see that prevalence of HPV in, in adult women gradually declines, but it doesn't decrease to a value of zero. In fact, if you look over the age of 50, the prevalence of HPV in adult women is still quite high at about 35%. And then if we look on the right-hand side, prevalence of HPV in adult males is higher than in women. And this effect is seen across all ages at around 65% prevalence, so much higher. Unlike women, these high HPV values do not decline with age, but they remain high regardless of how old you are. Persistence of HPV infections also increases as we get older. So this means that if you get an HPV infection, the chance that you're going to keep it and not clear that infection increases the older you get. So we've seen that the chance of exposure to HPV remains high in adult males and females, and that persistence increases with age. So these factors combined put us at risk for development of HPV-related diseases as we get older. Traditionally, HPV has really been thought of as an issue that affects women because of its link to cervical cancer. However, the burden of disease is shifting. HPV-related diseases in males are increasing. Specifically, all of the HPV-related cancers in males are rising, anal cancer, penile cancer, and oropharyngeal cancer. But the challenge is that unlike for cervix, there are no routinely available or recommended screening methods for these diseases. So we cannot find them before they become cancer like we can with cervix. Anal cancer incidence in both males and females has been rising over the past two decades and mortality rates are increasing. These increases in anal cancers are seen in all races and at all stages of diagnosis. Now, one group who's particularly at high risk for anal cancer is women who have been tre previously treated for cervical cancer. And this highlights the fact that being diagnosed with one HPV-related cancer puts us at increased risk for development of another HPV-related cancer. In the United States, HPV oral cancers in males have more than doubled over the past two decades. Interestingly, the same rates of oropharyngeal cancer in females have remained relatively stable over the same time period. The number of HPV-related cancers of the mouth and throat is significantly higher in males than it is in females. The rates are about four to five times higher in males than we see in females. So that's for cancers. Oral HPV infection is also higher in males than it is in females, which may in part explain why they have a higher risk for developing the HPV-related oral cancers. In fact, if we plot the declining rate of cervical cancer against the rising rate of oropharyngeal cancers caused by HPV in males, we can see that these curves have now crossed and what that means is we now have more actual cases of HPV-caused oropharyngeal cancer in males than we have number of cases of cervical cancer in females. This same effect seen in the United States has been seen in Canada and has been in, also been seen in high-resource countries around the world. 
Now I'd like to just briefly touch on the actual presentation and management of a few of the HPV-related diseases. So we could consider what this might mean for you if you're exposed to HPV. First, let's look at external genital warts. Well, they develop relatively quickly after HPV exposure, often within a few weeks to a few months. Treatments, as you can see, are destructive treatments. So where we're trying to destroy that area using liquid nitrogen or various solutions, carbon dioxide laser or surgical excision. Now, each episode often requires multiple treatments and visits. And also, if it's gone, if we've treated it, the recurrence rate after treatment is also quite high, more than 40%. So you require treatment for the original episode, but you may also require treatment for future episodes. Now, abnormal cells on the pap test typically take a little bit longer than external genital warts to develop. This will usually take several months up to a few years after HPV exposure. If you've had an abnormal pap, then often we, we may need to either repeat it in six months if the changes were low grade or mild, or we may need to refer you on to a specialist like myself in colposcopy, where we will do magnification with a microscope and we, we may need to biopsy the cervix. Treatments are usually done if we have high grade uh, precancerous cells on the cervix. And this will involve removing a patch of cells from the cervix, usually via something called a LEAP treatment, or it may require a larger area of removal called a cone biopsy. And then ongoing colposcopy visits are needed to detect recurrences, which again may require additional treatments. Cervical cancer in Canada is usually seen in women who've either never been screened with a pap test or have not had a pap test in more than five years. So that's the usual presentation for cervical cancer. However, we all have cases every year in women who in fact have had appropriate screening but still develop cervical cancer. And this is because our screening with pap tests is not perfect. Some of the symptoms of cervical cancer include bleeding after intercourse, excessive vaginal discharge, pelvic pain, and back pain. And if our tests are suspicious for cervical cancer, you're then referred on to a specialist, a gynae oncologist, for biopsy and consideration of treatment options. And these treatment decisions would be based on the stage and the type of cervical cancer. Now, the most common location for HPV cancers of the mouth and throat is at the back of the oral cavity. So the tonsils, the base of the tongue, and soft palate. Unfortunately, though, this typically presents with a painless swelling in the neck, which is an enlarged lymph node. And this is a sign at presentation, unfortunately, that the cancer has already spread. Treatment for HPV positive oropharyngeal cancers may involve surgery, but it often requires extensive chemo and radiotherapy, which has considerable side effects. Is it possible then to prevent the diseases that HPV causes? So when we think of strategies to prevent these types of HPV-related diseases, we need to consider primary prevention versus secondary prevention. So let's just look at that. For the past five to six decades, we've actually been practicing secondary prevention of HPV diseases. We recognize that HPV would infect people. We do pap screening to detect precancerous cells on the cervix. And then we do treatments such as LEAP to prevent it developing into invasive cancer. So we know the HPV will get into people, we detect it at early stages, and we treat those changes before they become invasive cancer. We do not have reliable organized screening methods like this for other sites. So we don't have such screening for vulvar, vaginal, or anal precancerous cells. Now, conversely, primary prevention of HPV would be preventing HPV infection after you've been exposed to HPV. So there's a few different ways you could achieve this. Safer sex practices, so trying to minimize your number of sexual partners, using condoms, although for HPV, they're not as good as they are for other things like chlamydia and gonorrhea. For HPV, condoms reduce HPV infection by about 70%. And then HPV vaccination is also our method of primary prevention. 
we continue to need both primary and secondary prevention methods to reduce HPV and disease because, for example, vaccination only prevents 90% of our HPV strains that are going to cause disease. So that's the majority, the vast majority, but there will always be certain uncommon strains which are not covered by vaccination. So we continue to need our cervical screening programs. Now I'd like to move on to HPV vaccines. Well, over the past 15 years, three vaccines for HPV have been developed, which protected us against either two types, four types, or the current nine types in the nine valent uh, vaccine that we now use. None of these three vaccines are live vaccines. They're all protein subunit vaccines. And the original four valent vaccine has now been replaced in Canada by the nine valent vaccine, and this is called Gardasil 9. As you can see, the nine valent vaccine protects us against type 6 and 11 in blue, and those are the two most common low risk strains of HPV. These are going to cause 90% of external genital warts, and it also protects against the seven most common in purple high risk types or oncogenic types of HPV. And these uh, seven types are going to cause 90% of the invasive cancers that are caused by HPV. As you probably know, we do have government funded provincial programs for HPV vaccination in Canada. And we're very lucky that now all provinces and territories in Canada now vaccinate boys and girls in our school-based programs. In addition, all regions have additional funded doses for high-risk individuals such as patients with HIV and men having sex with men or gay males. Now, as you can imagine, most of these programs were halted in the spring last year because of COVID and plans are underway to restart in some regions, but not yet in all. And I could also say that it's very nice that in Alberta and the Yukon, we now have HPV vaccines that are funded for all individuals, male and female, up to and including the age of 26. So we could hope for that in other provinces and territories. So we've said that all kids qualify for funded doses across Canada for HPV vaccines. However, unfortunately, uptake is not optimal. And I just want to show you, for example, in Ontario, and if we look at the 2018-19 school year, which is the most recent that we have data for, remember this is pre-COVID, uptake rates were less than 60% for HPV vaccination in the school-based program. And of course, the next two to three years after that, our COVID years, the uptake is going to be very bad because our school-based programs were halted. So we really need to go beyond just the school-based program. It's clearly been shown to be of value to vaccinate adult males and females in addition to adolescents. We know that the vaccination works very well in the adolescents and young adults with 97% efficacy at reducing disease. So now let's look at the evidence for vaccinating those of us who are over the age of 26. Well, the clinical trial in adult women, in fact, showed excellent efficacy, 89% reduction of persistent infection, abnormal PAPs, and external genital warts in women over the age of 24. This effect has now been studied up to 10 years, showing that it's a long lasting effect of the vaccination and that it does not require booster dosing. Adult males similarly developed excellent antibody levels, even when given over the age of 26, the same as younger males, where we've seen excellent efficacy at reducing disease. And the male trials have also been followed so far up to 10 years, showing no need for additional dosing. Now you might think that it's too late to be vaccinated if you've already been exposed in the past to HPV. So then we need to consider, is there value in vaccinating those patients who either have HPV disease now or have had it in the past? In fact, several studies have now found that vaccination against HPV can reduce the rate of recurrence of abnormal PAPs external genital warts, and vulvar precancerous cells, even if it's given after these patients have already undergone treatment. The same effect is seen in males. HPV vaccination has been shown to reduce recurrence of high-grade anal precancerous cells 
as well as external genital warts. So we can see that it's not too late to vaccinate adult females and males based on your age, based on your gender, or based on previous exposure to HPV or a history of HPV-related diseases. So I just briefly want to show you the approval and recommendations in Canada. So the nine-valent vaccine is currently approved by Health Canada, as you can see, for the following indications, and you'll notice the age of 45. Now, this is because Health Canada shows their upper age limit because their decisions are based on the published evidence to date. This is not to say that it stops working at the age of 46 or older. And in fact, in Canada, after a vaccine is licensed by Health Canada, we then look to our National Advisory Committee on Immunization, who advises us in more detail on which groups should be vaccinated. And you'll note in the NACI recommendations that they support vaccination over the age of 26, and they've chosen no upper age limit. And NACI has always recommended vaccination of those with a current or past history of HPV-related diseases. Now, our Society of GYN Oncologists, or Gynae Cancer Doctors of Canada, published a position statement a couple of years ago that went even further than NACI using even stronger language. They actively recommend universal HPV vaccination in Canada, regardless of age. So now let's think of the rationale why we would vaccinate adults as well as adolescents against HPV. Well, there are three main benefits to being vaccinated as an adult. Number one, as we've seen, there is a risk of new exposure and our desire is to vaccinate as soon as possible. Number two, HPV vaccines have been proven to reduce disease in adults as well as younger individuals. And number three, even if exposure has already occurred, if you've already had an HPV-related disease, vaccination is still of value. Now remember, the rationale and the reasons that we would review for you to be vaccinated also hold true for your partner. So our partners should also be vaccinated. So now let's move on to some practical tips about HPV vaccination. Well, it involves three doses over six months, and that's if we're over the age of 15 at first dose. In the school-based programs, the kids are under the age of 15 at first dose, so they get two doses over six months. If you miss a dose or delay a dose, then we just resume where you left off. There's no need to start all over again, no matter how much time has passed. If you were previously vaccinated with one of the first two uh, HPV vaccines, the bivalent with two types or the quadrivalent four types, you can be revaccinated with the nine valent vaccine. And this will give you the added protection against five additional high risk oncogenic HPV types. So the older types protected us against 70% of cancer strains, whereas the nine valent newer vaccine protects us against 90% of cancer strains. The most common side effects that we get, like most vaccines, are going to be the injection site reactions. So that's pain, redness, and swelling of the arm. And these typically go away in a few days to a week. How can we get vaccinated? Well, we can get vaccinated by our healthcare provider, where they would write a prescription and they might fax it into a pharmacy and you'd bring it back for us to give it to you. But during COVID times, this actually, this step can all be done virtually. We could have a discussion with you. We can fax that prescription in. And in many provinces, the pharmacist can actually vaccinate you. So depending upon where you live, you may not need to see the healthcare provider to actually have the vaccine into the arm. You can be vaccinated at other types of clinics, such as sexual health clinics and travel medicine clinics. So they often will stock it directly. As more of us get vaccinated for COVID, we need to be aware of the following intervals. We wait 14 days after an HPV vaccine to get a COVID vaccination. And conversely, we wait 30 days or a month after a COVID vaccine to get an HPV vaccine. Right now, COVID vaccination should be our priority. The dosing intervals for HPV vaccination are flexible and we can adjust around the COVID shot. We're starting to see some really good secure vaccination tracking apps, such as this one from Can Immunize. 
And if you go to their site and you log in, you can enter your vaccine records for you and your family members for all of your vaccines, including COVID, including HPV vaccines, and you can set reminders and you can see recommended vaccines by age. So it's particularly useful as we're moving forward and trying to track all of these vaccines that we're receiving. It's never too late to vaccinate for HPV. Remember, HPV infections are common in adults. The evidence is showing long-term efficacy of HPV vaccination when given as an adult. And we can definitely vaccinate people who've previously been exposed and who may have already had disease. Expanding our programs to include gender neutral vaccination, meaning boys and girls, as well as adult vaccination, will help accelerate us on our pathway to elimination of HPV related cancers. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. So we still have some time uh, for a Q&A. So if you haven't yet submitted your questions, please make sure to do so. Uh, but we'll start with our first question that we have here, which is, can you comment on the effect that the suspension of cancer screening services, such as for cervical cancer, uh, will have on future diagnoses? Yeah, so this is a concern for a lot of us, and it's not just for cervical cancer screening, but for breast screening as well. So we have definitely seen an impact in colposcopy where patients are coming in with um, abnormal precancerous cells and we see it in mammography and we even see it in the treatment end as well in oncology. Luckily, it's only been halted for let's say about six months. And so hopefully these effects won't be as devastating as they may be in other areas where people who should have had treatment had to delay their treatment. From a screening standpoint, the six months is probably adequate for us to then pick up that high grade abnormal cells, let's say six months later and not have it be detrimental to development of invasive cancers. I worry more about the people who are actually already diagnosed who are having treatments delayed and we are still seeing significant delays surgically especially as the impact on our hospitals with COVID admissions has really dramatically decreased elective surgeries. Cancer surgery is not elective, but how it's defined as elective, meaning it's not imminent to be done in the next two to four weeks. And so for me, that's really the part that I find particularly difficult is those patients who we had wanted to operate on and we've had to delay. With numbers starting to go down, we are optimistic that those types of surgical programs are going to hopefully start resuming later this month and into next month. With screening, we are now back to trying to get patients in for their cervical screening with primary care. I think that's a challenge for some patients because some primary care providers are still not doing in-person office visits, but I really, really hope that that is going to change as we have more people vaccinated that these office visits can resume. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Do you have any advice for someone wanting to talk to their partner about also getting an HPV vaccination? Yeah, so it depends. Sometimes You have to know your partner well. You have to know the personality of the partner and how to bring this up. But what I would suggest, the best way is to stay away from this being a sexually transmitted infection when we're talking about it. And we usually refer to this as a vaccine that prevents cancers. And it used to be we thought of it just for cervical cancer, but now increasingly we're worried about males with oropharyngeal cancer. So it's not just for cervical cancer. So we can prevent so many different types of cancer with this vaccine. And when we put it that way, most partners actually do want to get it. And I always joke that if you're trying to talk to a male partner about HPV vaccination, the one thing that you can do is show them pictures of external genital warts because men definitely don't want that and will want to be vaccinated. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, next question. Are there any risk factors that can make someone more susceptible to HPV-related diseases? It's a really good question. Yes, there are, in fact. So when I'm seeing you for the first time, uh, and doing screening, or if I'm seeing somebody who already has HPV and abnormal cells, risk factors that will make them do not as well as the next person, 
smoking status is especially important. So this is something we talk about on every visit if we have somebody who smokes, because it's been well shown that those patients with cervical cancer, a higher proportion of them are smokers. Same thing with other HPV-related cancers. So that's one risk factor is smoking status. And when you put it that way, it often helps people to quit. It's a motivating factor to help them to quit. Immunocompromising states, either diseases that make you immunocompromised like HIV, or medications that we give you for a different disease that make you immunocompromised. So when we're treating somebody, say, for rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's, connective tissue disorders, and we're giving you medications to bring down the immune system, that also puts you at risk if you contact HPV for development of HPV-related diseases. Transplant patients, for example, have to be on immunosuppressing agents for life, so they are also at risk for HPV-related diseases. So there's various groups like that that are certainly more at risk than others. Definitely. Uh, next question, will vaccination for an adult with a history of HPV reduce the risk or rate of transmission to partners? That's a great question, and it's recently been shown that not just for yourself, but when you're vaccinated, that yes, you do reduce transmission to your partner. So it does also do that, even if you already have HPV, for, let's say from a previous partner, if we have a new partner, it has been shown that if we vaccinate just the patient, and let's say the partner is not vaccinated, it reduces the transmission to that unvaccinated partner. I would prefer both partners get vaccinated for their, for their own benefit, but we do see reduction in transmission just from that, yes. Uh, next question. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what this term, so correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, uh, but the question is, uh, does Lakin scolar sclerosis scolar yeah, yeah. Uh, benefit from HPV vaccines? So lichen sclerosis is not related to HPV. So that is a skin condition, a vulvar uh, dermatologic skin condition, which has its own risks if not treated. It can progress to vulvar cancer, but this is not related to an HPV cause. So vaccination would not change a patient's lichen sclerosis or risks. It's just, it helps you with all of the other risks that we have just from our normal day-to-day -day risks of HPV exposure. Uh, next question. So uh, this uh, participant says they have taken letrozole for nine years and are wondering if there is new information for breast cancer patients staying on it for more than five years. So I would refer you to your breast doctor for that because it, uh, as a gynecologist outside of my realm of expertise. And last question here. So it says the vaccination schedule for school age children in Quebec is different. Two doses several years apart and two different vaccines are used. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, it is Quebec. Yes, it has. Um, it is different than all of the other provinces and territories in their vaccine schedule. So they recently switched from two doses of the quadrivalent vaccine to the first dose in the fall would be nine valent vaccine. And then the second dose is given years later and it's the bivalent vaccine. So it only protects against two types. For myself, that's not what I would want for my child. So if I had a child in school-based program in Quebec, I would have them have the first nine valent dose and then I would have them vaccinated and it'd have to be outside the school program. I'd have to pay for it at a six month interval with the nine valent vaccine. Great, thank you. So uh, that's it that we have for questions, which is actually perfect timing. So we can move on uh, to Abby's portion of the presentation. So we'll bring her back on. Okay, Abby. And I will just shift the presenter mode to Abby. There you go. So you should be able to share your slides now. Awesome. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Abby. Thank you so much for having me here today.
All right. So first here, just a little bit about myself. My name is Abby. Um, I am a registered yoga and meditation instructor. Um, and I'm also a mindfulness educator. So a part of my job and my work that I really love is talking to folks just like you um, about why mindfulness is so important and how it was so transformational in my life that I decided to pursue it um, full time. So today we are going to unpack the power of the here and now, reducing stress and anxiety with mindfulness. So first I want to begin with what is mindfulness because I feel like mindfulness has become a little bit of a buzzword um, in society these days. So we talk a lot about being mindful or being mindful of something, um, but what does this really mean? What can the practice of mindfulness do for us? So in the natural human experience alone, it's already quite difficult to not get caught up in thoughts about the past and of the future. Now, especially when we are experiencing something, whether it is illness or otherwise, that allows us or causes us to feel out of control, this can become increasingly difficult to not get caught up in the what ifs and the history or track records of things that have happened in the past and being afraid of them repeating. So when we practice mindfulness, simply all we're doing is calmly focusing our awareness on the present moment without the judgment or the mental commentary of our experience. So I like to say that mindfulness is the art of just being. And when we continue to practice mindfulness, we are slowly beginning to teach and train our minds to live in the present moment more naturally. And to spend a moment to talk about why this practice works essentially, or what is happening when we practice mindfulness that allows it to give us these benefits. So I have a little diagram here that you can see of the stress response. So we can think of this as any time our body is anxious, stressed, um, when we are feeling overwhelmed, our brain doesn't really know the difference between mental stress and the stress of running away from a tiger per se, or back in the early civilizations, running away from some sort of fear or threat like an animal. So our brain doesn't know the difference between that. So when we feel stress, we are sent this stress hormone to our kidney that release adrenaline and cortisol up into our major organs of our body. So not only is this affecting our mind and our ability to stay present, but we notice some physical experiences happening too. Maybe we begin to hyperventilate and we notice that our lungs are beginning to take in more air. We have our heart rate increase because of this adrenaline and cortisol, higher blood pressure. Our digestion slows down because we need more energy sent up to fight off the threat that our body thinks is there. Our liver converts glycogen to glucose. So we're really affecting the whole body when we are living so often in the past and the future. And unfortunately, there are a lot of us in society that are constantly living in this stress response. And this can have some serious effects on our body as well as our state of being and ability to be present. So we can think of this practice of mindfulness similarly to how we think of going to the gym or working out. So every time we choose to sit and bring our awareness to the present moment, even if it's within that mindfulness exercise, every time we realize we've drifted off into a thought and we return to what's present, it's like doing a bicep curl for our entire system and for the mindfulness muscle in our brain. So we spent a moment there talking a bit about the physical complications of stress and how mindfulness 
can work to change this in the body. Mindfulness is essentially the anecdote to this stress cycle. So when we're able to reverse the stress cycle, we are able to bring these major organs back into more of a regular function. Now let's spend a moment looking at more of the psychological nature of this mindfulness practice. So I really love this explanation by Buddha. He describes there to be two arrows of suffering that we commonly experience as humans. He describes this first arrow as the immediate pain of our unfortunate incident. So something that is beyond our control, whether that be an illness or nature, something that has happened into our life that has caused us some suffering that is unavoidable. Now, with this first arrow, we often bring ourselves a second arrow of suffering. This second arrow of suffering that Buddha describes is our reaction psychologically to the pain of this first arrow. So it's our anxiety, our stress, our anger, our frustration, the emotion that we add on to this pain that causes us to suffer a lot more than if we were to just deal with the first arrow. So mindfulness strengthens our ability to become aware of this second arrow and help us eventually reduce the effects of this second arrow so that we can deal with whatever pain is right in front of us in that moment without having to use our commentary of past and future and fear. And we just look at what's right in front of us with more of a clear perspective, what's really going on for me right now. So when we practice mindfulness, it becomes a little bit easier to regulate our emotions in this way. And so bringing mindfulness into your life doesn't have to be difficult or some sort of added stress, right? That's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do for ourselves. So there are many ways that mindfulness might look in your life. We might picture mindfulness to look like someone sitting in meditation, and that could be a little bit intimidating to some of us. So there are several ways that we can bring this into our life. And one of the um, ways that I really love and really love to talk about um, is the power of practicing gratitude. You can see there some of the effects from simply expressing what we're grateful for, whether we take a few moments to write it down, or perhaps we express to another person or to that thing or moment, um, or even just silently in our mind. The meditation and mindfulness exercises, of course, are wonderful because especially of the nature of our world lately, there are so many beautiful resources and um, content out there, even virtually, that you can make use of and explore. Yoga is a wonderful mindfulness exercise if that's of your interest. But even just walking in nature with no distractions, really paying attention to what's around you. If you're interested in art, painting, drawing, coloring, we're looking for those activities that bring you into that state of flow where you're just immersed in what you're doing and focusing on what's present. That's mindfulness. So it doesn't have to look so black and white. Even cooking a a nice healthy meal or a nutritious meal for yourself is a really great way to practice mindfulness, focusing on the foods and the nutrients and really taking your time to cook that for yourself. Gratitude, as I mentioned. And another really great exercise, even just before you go to bed at night or when you wake up in the morning, is a simple body scan. So just taking a moment, maybe closing your eyes and just scanning through your body, noticing how am I feeling today? Noticing how each part of your body is feeling today. And just taking a moment to bring the awareness inside rather than up in the mind all the time. So we'll take a few moments now and we will try this together, a little bit of mindfulness. All right, so for this exercise, we will simply just be 
seated or however you are positioned with yourself right now is wonderful. Take a few moments and make sure that you're comfortable. Maybe you shift around in your seat or you want to get up and move. Whatever you need, if you're a little chilly, put a sweater on. This is a few moments in your day to really just be with yourself. So allow yourself to be comfortable. And once you're in an ideal seat, it really doesn't matter how you're sitting. We will do a little bit of meditation today, just because I want to show you that it doesn't have to be this thing that we don't think we can be a part of or that we're not ready to do or that we don't know how to do. And then it really is simple and easy for us to incorporate into our lives. So for this small mindfulness meditation, you might be sitting cross legs, you might be sitting on a chair, you can even take a lie. If you want to lie down, that's wonderful. So when you found that seat or your position, gently straighten your spine. So whether that means reaching the crown up towards the sky, allow your shoulders to soften down. And we'll begin with an exercise that I enjoy teaching to bring the awareness inside. So without moving your head too much, just with the eyes, notice in your space if you can find five things that you can see with your eyes. Not thinking about these things too much, just noticing five things. Once you've made a mental note of those five objects, softly blink the eyes to close or take a soft gaze, whatever feels safer for you. And then tune into your ears and see if you can notice four subtle things that you might be able to hear even if one of them is the sound of my voice. Maybe if you're not sure exactly what the sound is, that's okay. Just notice four sounds. So once you've made a mental note of those four things, Allow your awareness to arrive in your body and notice three things that you can feel. Perhaps it's the temperature of the room, the way your clothes feel against your body, perhaps where your hands are resting. Noticing three things that you can feel in this moment. And then softly allow your awareness to drift to your nose. Can you notice two things that might make up an aroma of the room around you? Two things you might be able to smell. Even if they're not correct, it doesn't matter. Just notice. And as you continue with your awareness at your nose, simply begin to notice your breath now. Moving in through your nose, filling up your lungs, and moving out through your nose, softening your heart, your chest, your ribcage. 
continue to follow your breath as if you were an observer, noticing the whole way in the nostrils and the whole way out of the nostrils. Perhaps you notice a pause after your breath. See if you can allow your inhale to just happen naturally without gripping for it. Trusting that the body breathes on its own. And how amazing that is that we don't even have to ask for this. Following each breath all the way in and all the way out. Slowing the breath down. And if the mind is busy, that's okay. It's the mind's job to think. Remembering that every time we return our awareness back to the present moment, it's like doing a bicep curl for our brain. This might happen multiple times in our practice. Allow yourself to let go of expectations. When you notice your mind has drifted into a thought, perhaps you label it as thinking and just return back to the breath, using this breath as your anchor, your reminder of the present moment. When we allow ourselves to live often in the present, we begin to appreciate the things around us. We can sense our feelings. And we can decide whether to react to a situation or whether to respond. When we spend time in the future and future thoughts of worry or anxiety, we begin to create this narrative of ourselves that isn't true. Because future and past thoughts are just imagination. The only way that they exist is when we give thought to them. And so they're in our imagination. When we realize this, we can too realize that this narrative we've created of about ourselves, that something bad is going to happen to us, or maybe that we're not good enough, whatever that may be, we begin to realize that it's not reality. Because reality can only live in the present moment. I invite you now to take a moment to think of one thing that you are deeply grateful for right now. One thing in your life that is going good and that you can express gratitude for. It doesn't have to be grand. Perhaps it's the weather 
or the way a song on the radio makes you feel. It can be anything. And as you hold that image in your mind, to close our practice, I'll ring my mindfulness sound bowl. Allow yourself to focus on the sound until it completely fades away and nothing else. Very slowly, allow your chin to soften towards your chest. Perhaps you roll the neck from side to side if you need a little stretch. And then very slowly in your own time, begin to blink your eyes open, returning back to one another on the screen in your own time. Thank you so much for taking a moment to practice some mindfulness with me. And take a moment to express some gratitude to yourself for this small act of self-care. Namaste, everybody. Thank you so much, Abby, for that session. That was really, really wonderful to be a part of. And thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us and for being here today. Uh, so with that, we will end uh, today's presentation. Um, just a quick question for Abby. Can mindfulness practice help an eight-year-old child who is experiencing some, trust, some stress due to COVID? Absolutely. I um, think that mindfulness is something that children especially can relate to because it is so simple. I think one of the hardest things about being adults is having to learn these techniques to live presently. And I often find myself asking, why didn't I learn this a long time ago? So I think that mindfulness absolutely um, is really beneficial. There are definitely some great um, tools, even on YouTube, um, mindfulness for kids, um, different videos and things like that. Um, or even just simply taking some time um, with your child to maybe write like a gratitude list together um, or doing some of these practices together can be really great as well. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you to Abby and to Dr. Duran for your presentations today. Uh, so we'll end the presentation here. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Take care and stay safe and as healthy as possible. And have a great day, everybody.